Let's start with this. <clears throat> to each and every one of you, the question goes like this. What is your biggest fear regarding the coronavirus? And when you think about answering it, I'm going to repose it by saying, but not focused on your sales or your profit or your loss. But I'm asking that you have very, very, very personally, what is your biggest fear at this time? Now hold that thought. Metrics. Kev Casey and I love metrics. Since COVID has come in on this subject, in a survey done by Forbes a couple of weeks ago, 67% of people have identified increased stress in their lives. 57% have increased anxiety in their lives. 54% say they are emotionally exhausted. 53% say they experience sadness from day to day to day. 50% feel irritable. And 42% feel like their mental health has declined. Now there are numbers that six weeks ago, two months ago, we would not be incorporating into our thought patterns, our processes, and our dialogue. More numbers on productivity. So the productivity from the same source goes like this. 28% are saying they have difficulty concentrating. 20% are saying it's taken way longer to complete a task. 15% say they're having difficulty focusing and thinking. 12% say that there's an increase in procrastination by putting things off. And 12% say that they're having difficulty juggling tasks. So they are now real numbers. They are real events that are happening in our business lives. In my previous three sessions, I laid some groundings. The first session talked about emotions. It talked about on a very personal level, how this is affecting us. We talked on fear and how fear gets affected by so many different thought patterns we have. We addressed and talked about the fact that emotions are very good in that they guide you and direct you to solutions that you should have. And the obvious one that stands out is by having fear of this virus, we react logically by distancing, cleaning our hands and doing all the things that we're doing. We talked on things like uh, pockets of control. In the second session, we moved a little bit more into, again, our individual thoughts and the reality we have 50,000 thoughts a day on average, and how do we control them? And most of those 50,000 thoughts, when you're in a negative environment, take you down a path that is not where you really want to be. You want to be positive, they'll take you negative. So we, we explored mindfulness in that session. The third session, we, we moved it into defining and labeling and talking about what we are experiencing. And we are experiencing grief. So we explored in that session, the five stages of grief and how we go through them systematically. We go back and forth in them. We talked about collective grief, collective trauma and anticipatory trauma and anticipatory grief. So they were all three sessions focused totally internally in ourselves. This session is gonna move us outside that a little tiny bit in that how we as leaders, managers, communicators with other people can take some of the things we've talked about but an awareness on going and dealing with our staff and our teams. So imagine starting our team meetings with the question, that I asked you earlier. What is your biggest fear regarding coronavirus? And let that sink in. So leaders like ourselves must not forget that there's a human side to our business. We tend to, in times of crisis, go look at our sales figures, our balance sheets. How are we going to keep our business side running. But if we solely focus on that, we're going to lose the key element of our business. 
and that is the, the, the souls who work with us, our team, our, our, the thing that make our company a company. So we cannot be focused on solving the problem by forgetting the heightened emotion that has come with it and is permeating us today. We are in a crisis, accept it. But we simply cannot focus on numbers and metrics only that have dollar bills in front of them. We have to focus on the metrics that have the soft emotions that we talked about before. In order to do that, we got to let people vent and express themselves. Once you speak, once you enunciate your sensation of feeling, of fear, of uncertainty, of, of anger, and I always like using the word righteous anger and righteous rage, then you, you, you get back to what psychologists and coaches call psychological and emotional mastery. We get the semblance that we are gaining back some of the control that was lost by all of the uncertainty that's happening. It then allows us to move forward as individuals, allows us to move forward with our teams and to go through that process. Our anchors, and every one of you anchors yourself in your family, in your community, in your business, in your practices, in your routines, in your getting up in the morning and working out, going for your coffee, a jumping bean, making your way to the office. You're anchored. We have individual anchors. We have interpersonal anchors. We have business anchors and community anchors. And these have all been uprooted. And we have no say or control over them to an extent. And what makes it even more traumatic for us, and we've said this on our previous calls, is this is global. 7.8 billion people, excluding Republicans, I might add, uh, are experiencing the fear. And again, I'm, I'm going to nod to Kev Casey here, but I did find a study that I will send to you, Kevin, that identifies by party in the United States, different sections of fear. And believe it or not, there's a massive discrepancy between what is being experienced by Democrats and what's being experienced by Republicans. And it is validating that statement I just made. So to turn our attention solely to business and the business of business and the business of commerce, while inherently is, a, is an owner's perspective and a manager's initial reaction, we can't do that. So these de decisions must be made. They have to be made, but, they, but we, can't, we just cannot ignore the emotional crisis that's sitting within our teams and in ourselves. As we're going through this, we must, it is demanded, it is incumbent upon us to find out and explore how the crisis is affecting our fellow employees, our teams on a regular basis. And this means you got to communicate not only as a group, but individually, one-on-one. -on -one. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. As, on, as owners, we take responsibility for managing the emotional and the psychological fallout of those who are in our employ on their own direction and people we interact every day. Whether you want to take that consciously or subconsciously, it is a responsibility of an owner, of a manager, of a leader. If we ignore that, it's at our detriment, our corporate detriment and the individual's detriment. And it all boils down to communication. <clears throat> More statistics. A study done a couple of weeks ago uh, by Qualtrics, they find that 47% of employees thought that their managers or their owners were not tuned into their well-being. 69% of that study felt that their mental health had declined and 61% felt that they were absolutely less productive. Those metrics have a longer impact on business and where we're going to go as we come out of this than people realize today. A couple of remembers. Remember that the more we listen, 
the more we restore our and our friends and our team's anchors. The more we listen. Remember, it is natural for each of us to feel off kilter or down or depressed or upset or, or fear. It is natural. Remember that. Remember that meaning and purpose will help us move out of loneliness and that sense of isolation. Meaning and purpose. Remember when you need help, ask for it. But as a manager and an owner, it is incumbent upon you to create the environment and the platform whereby when your team or an employee needs help, it is available to them easily without judgment. And remember that a big part of our strong mental um, fabric is feeling and being connected. Feeling and being connected. So how do we take some learnings, knowledge, and let them come inside ourselves as human beings, again, leaders, owners, managers, and, and work with them and be able to provide the guidance and the direction to our team. Everyone would have heard of a term called emotional intelligence, known by its brand name EQ, EI, EQ, uh, emotional intelligence quotient, relationship management. In a nutshell, those who, who have great emotional intelligence are easily anchored in empathy. And these times call for us to start with empathy. And emotional intelligence is the ability to identify, to understand, and to manage not only your own emotions, but to help and guide with others. And most of us have that intuitively. And can we learn how to be better at it? Absolutely. Can we learn how to engage with others emotionally when we're more grounded in the non-emotional, more logical domain? Yes, we can. And the ultimate objective is to get emotions that are working for you and with you rather than against you. And back in the session one, we talked about the importance of these emotions and how we have categorizations of some emotions, fear, anger, rage, that we look at as being bad emotions when they're not. And we look at things like good emotions, such as compassion, love, and unconditional giving, which are good emotions, and they are. And my perspective is that all emotions are good. All emotions guide you. You are not your emotions. You own your emotions, lean in, accept and experience. We've, we've done that in the past. So we have to move ourselves to help people avoid panic. We have to empower ourselves and others to think rationally and guide us all in a term that I've used called emotional connectivity. And that's working with our emotional organization, which go back Months ago, to have conversations like this was an awkward thing to have. We've got guidance from all kinds of people on being aware of mental health issues and exercising good mental health discipline. Well, those skills today and over the past six weeks are of paramount importance. And if anybody wants to go off and do a Google search on any of these types of topics, you will find unlimited articles, guidance, mindfulness exercises, meditation perspectives, and on and on. And each and every one of them will help a little tiny bit because they're focusing us on being in the moment. So how do you activate your EQ in this particular crisis, but, but also in other times? Well, first and foremost is to listen carefully. And listening is a talent that most of us don't have. In order to listen, we have to be present. In order to be present, we have to be mindful. We have to exclude anything else that is going on and focus 
and the person we're dealing with, preferably visually and auditorily, so we can go eyeball to eyeball. You listen fully. You listen with your body, mind, and spirit. You listen. And questions like, and I always like probing, focused, emotional questions that are not invasive and crossing over the boundaries of privacy, but are simple, focused questions such as how we started this session. How is this affecting you? How do you feel? And what is your biggest fear? You have to be non-judgmental. You have to be compassionate, empathetic. You do not interrupt the person. You do not propose solutions. So you are there while a person can speak, venting. And as you do ask questions coming back, and the questions are more focused on what they're talking about and not changing your tack or your track. You do not respond to questions when someone tells you how they are feeling. You don't go and say, I know how you feel, because guess what? You do not. You can never, ever, ever, ever underestimate or overestimate the difference between a feeling from person A and a feeling from person B. So don't go and say, I know how you're feeling. Something like, I can imagine how you're feeling, softer approach, gives you words that will work. Never ever invalidate a feeling. And those who've been around me for a while have heard this over and over and over again. Feelings are always correct at that moment in time. A feeling is not based in logic. A feeling is based inside of you. So if you have a feeling of whatever it is, now let's use fear being the big one today, then accept it, it is correct. And if someone is talking to you and they're saying they're fearful and you're make the statement, you know, you shouldn't feel that way. Things are not that bad. No, reframe your way of thinking. Say, I am so sorry you feel that way and engage with them and share that feeling. If someone is telling you a whole bunch of issues going on, you say, well, you're overreacting to this circumstance. Well, in an active listening environment, no, we would not do that. It's thank you for sharing. Tell me more. Because by naming it and exposing it, we empower the person, our team, to move through that. Second thing, to, to buff up emotional intelligence, is to show empathy. And that we are seeing in our world for the past six weeks is growing exponentially. Where was that? I guess it was a hidden factor in many businesses in the past. Tears are okay. When we're talking to our staff or talking to somebody, it is okay to cry. It is okay to shed tears. Uh, a friend of mine in Sarasota, a lady named Carol Winkleman, many, many years ago, I, I went to her and we, we did a whole bunch of young Aryan um, psychotherapy. And she made a statement to me once and it stayed with me all the time. It said, no matter who you're speaking to, male or female, and you're engaging in something that engages emotions, expect the range of emotions. And if somebody's in front of you and they're crying and they're experiencing that, let them breathe through it, pass them a tissue, don't negate it and don't celebrate it, just accept it and work your way through it. Now she's trained at doing that. For me, I think if someone's in front of any one of us and they're shedding tears, we're gonna be taking a pregnant pause to say, how do I deal with that? Or how do I react with that? Same with anger, by the way. So it's a matter of being open, accepting it, and knowing that any and all emotions are never directed from one person to the other, to that person working through their trauma of the moment. So in, in empathy, my, my visual on it is when you're dealing with anybody is be very comfortable to jump into their high heels, feel their feet, sense what they're sensing, get and embody their time and space right now and look at the topic through their lens, through their eyes and get their feelings, not your feelings. 
And it gets very uncomfortable to do that till you establish your own level of comfort with it. But to be with somebody who is experiencing any form of trauma and you, you get in and share it, it moves you so much closer to being a co-partner with them and walking through it rather than providing an obstacle or opposition to them doing it. We as managers tend at times to focus on the macro of the business and not the micro of the business. But the micro is what is essential. And if the micro can kill you, this virus that we're experiencing right now is micro. We cannot see it. We can certainly feel it. We won't smell it. So we got to know how to go from the micro aspects of our business right down to the essence of what affects somebody. Stock up on compassion when you're engaging with your staff. Stock up on compassion. The third piece on the EQ hit list is do what you can. You can't solve everything and you're not meant to. So be authentic. Ask what you can do to, that, to the person. What can I do to help you? And if it's in your control and power to do it, acknowledge and validate you'll do it and do it. But if you cannot do it, acknowledge and validate that you cannot do it. As you're speaking to people in this environment we're in today, communicate your strategy to keep the business flowing. It's important for our staff and our teams to know that, okay, we're, we're shut down for three months, but we got this and this happening. And they don't need the micro aspects. They just need to know generally all is well overall. Here's where we are. We anticipate short term. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Demonstrate that you care. That's essential. And be grateful for the opportunity to speak to the person or the team or the team leaders and so on. As I'm grateful to be speaking to you, taking my knowledge from my, my coaching and my metaphysical side and sharing it with our community now, which I had not done for 30 years previous. So time is, a, is for us to do that, to be grateful. Get yourself educated little by little. And I referred in previous sessions, and I will refer again, the Red Cross has a uh, document program information and like a first aid course, I'll call it a second aid course that focuses on mental health. And please don't take the word mental health as a negative. There's strong mental health. We have to talk about it it's like our physical health. We, we can go from being very weak on a, on a road bike and we can train ourselves to be strong. And the same happens with our whole mental and spiritual side. So get educated so that you can at least know some tidbits, clues on how to address people. I like, I like the other thing is just to be strong and visionary, but also be authentic and, and, and empathetic. So be real, be honest, be strong, be visionary, and, and do that. Establish routines in our companies in how we connect with our teams. And I'm going to touch a little bit more on that. And communicate a lot. I don't think that we can over-communicate today. And while owners in businesses, and I'm an example, could walk in and out of my office under a normal set of circumstances, go into my office, do my work and leave, for some reason that was felt to be okay before. It no longer feels okay. I personally, as the owner of Maritech, feel an, a draw to speak more frequently to my staff. And I'm, and I'm doing it. So that moves us to another carry forward from our session number three. And this is where we want to focus on growth. And in focusing on growth, we take everybody and give someone a target. We talked the last time on the five stages of grief, and I briefly mentioned that there was a sixth stage in that process of grieving and is finding meaning. As we go through this whole process, if we can anchor ourselves into a pillar of meaning, ourselves, and then share that with the team, 
It's great. And some examples of that, and you will create your own and they'll become very personal for you or very personal to your company. But there's, we will come out of this with a greater appreciation for life. Fact. We will come out with increased personal resilience and strength. We're going to see greater opportunities in everything, whether it's getting together for a glass of wine or going out and having a dance. We're going to find greater opportunities as a result of this. It will be magnified and amplified like no one ever believes. We will and are definitely doing it as an example here. And again, Board of Trade for creating these environments. We are creating stronger interpersonal relationships. We are getting closer and closer and closer the further and further physically apart we were. And that is magical. And in the area where we don't like talking much, we're all going to experience a significant spiritual and metaphysical growth. I mentioned probably in the first or second session, a nice line, I'm going to put it out again, that we, very fortunately, very awakeningly wise, are getting to see and experience both the beauty and the fragility of life. So the, the emotional roller coaster run is taking us through our ups and downs, and we're learning, and we're becoming better, bigger, stronger. So let me do this. Let me unpack some guidance, and then as we've done in our other sessions, open ourselves up for dialogue questions if you feel inclined. On the communication piece, <clears throat> let me, before I start it, throw a few more metrics. Questions asked to people on communication. What do staff want in communication? Through this series of time of, let's not call it isolation, of this time of retreat. 90% want weekly communication from the company. 90%. 57% would like to be communicated with every other day. 29% would like daily. So, wow, our staff, the people who work and make our businesses strong and healthy, who build our business for us, want more communication. So what are we going to do? Here's some things. Number one, and many of us have done this already, but if you have not done it, think about it, and perhaps you should action it. Establish a common vehicle for communication. And I'm not selling any particular brand, but whether it's Zoom, Skype, whether it's Microsoft Teams, it doesn't matter. But pick one, and that's your baseline for your company. And my recommendation is, as we're doing here, if you can have video and audio, the communication is better than A without B. Secondly, is make sure every single person has access to it, and it's free to them you are obliged to create the vehicle to communicate with your staff. Structure, routine. So set up a weekly meeting. Now, if your company is so big that you got 500 people, it's probably awkward to do. In that particular case, you'd probably set up a weekly meeting with your team leaders and managers, and they in turn subset it down, and thereafter that session, host a meeting with their teams. But the idea is to set up a regular meeting with as much of your team as you can, one, and then periodically you can subset it if you want, as I did with my team a couple of days ago, we got together with our accounting people only. Last week we got together with everybody. The idea is to keep that communication going. And pass that obligation to your team leaders in a big company or subsets of your company and so on. There is a term that, I, that, that we've used in the past, the, the water cooler uh, coffee uh, gathering. We should encourage that to happen amongst our team. So your vehicle is set up. If four people want to grab a coffee at 10.30 in the morning, which they used to do, encourage them to have their coffee at 10.30 in the morning together online. So... Two places. We're going to focus, now that we got that vehicle in place, we're going to put our teams together. And we're going to first and foremost start every conversation 
from a place of empathy. Every time, how are you feeling? That's a question that should become part of our daily lexicon. How's the virus affected you? And let each person express themselves. In our company, many years ago, and we do it probably once or twice a year, we, we take a lesson I learned from Chief Michelle Joe in Con River, and that's the use and the power of a talking stick that the Indians use. And um, the Con River um, experience that I had years ago brought that to me. So when you were speaking, you have the talking stick. Nobody is allowed to interrupt you. You own the microphone. So if you have that approach in your mind and you create a circle ceremony on Zoom or Skype, all you have to do is let that person have the talking stick for the moment in time. And they are empowered to say absolutely nothing if they want. They hold silence. That's okay. But empower everybody to have their moment to express themselves how they wish. And silence is a great expression. And don't be afraid of them. They feel awkward and uncomfortable. And um, I think I saw Wayne Purchase maybe on the line here with me. And he experienced an early talking stick with me where I actually brought in a, an, an authentic talking stick. And, and it, was, it was powerful. So water cooler sessions, definitely got to have them. For yourself, you have to listen and speak from your emotional center, from your heart. Listen from your heart. So that's priority one. And you talk to yourself. And if that chews up that whole session, done. Your next session, you want to talk business. We ultimately want to talk business. Everybody wants to talk business. But it's a second role to this. So meeting one is done. We just talked about everybody's feelings. Great. We're going to have another meeting next Wednesday. And here's the agenda. You start the meeting off the next Wednesday. And what do you do? How are you feeling? What's going on? And... As you move through the process, you will ultimately find time to talk on your business. Let's engage everybody in the business. How are we as a company doing? Engage in some forward thinking. And that's going to become much more important as we get closer I'm to the now. end of this cycle. Ring. When we go about getting ready to open up, we're going to want all of our teams engaged. How are we going to do this? Because we as owners, Truly, honest to God, don't have a clue. Let's accept it. It's our staff and our team know how to run our business. We just happen to be the, the someone had a crazy idea one day and said, let's, let's go do this. <clears throat> Ask your teams, even in the middle, what can we as a company be doing better? What can we do? Can we do better now? When we go back to work, what can we do better? How do you think we should change? How should you change your role? Now what you're doing is you're engaging individuals on, on the future orientation direction of your company. Take the ideas, take the suggestions, and be as open to criticism as you are to suggestions. We're not all Donald Trump. We don't need pats on our back. In my particular case, I would rather know what I'm doing wrong in my business than what I'm doing right. I want to fix the wrong, the right, if it keeps going, I'm assuming it'll go along, but hey, let's work that as well. Share any good news from your company with your staff, whether you have bid a project and won, and they are not at the level to even know about it normally, share it. Talk about projects, talk about ideas, talk about what your management team is doing. What are they strategizing? Share more than you normally would, expose more than you normally would, and become way more transparent than you normally would. And seek some long-term ideas from them. What do you think our company's doing? Where are we going? So priority one, focus on the people, the emotions. How are you doing? Next one, how are we as a company doing? Let me end it by just throwing out a couple of one-liners. And, and, I, and I did this the last time. I do it probably every time. Empathy, grace, resilience, dignity, compassion. Just let that sink in. Empathy, grace, Resilience, dignity, compassion. Own them. They're yours to own. Own them. Emotional stability and agility. When we have a team empowered with strong mental health, when we got a strong, supportive team around, 
when Bob can talk to Sally about some emotional stress and know it's done openly and it's done with unconditional love, we end up with better, stronger teams. Purpose. Everyone has a purpose. Let's make sure people understand their purpose. Let's refer to this as a retreat and not as isolation. We have the opportunity for great personal learning, corporate learning, the ability to restructure and redefine what happens when we come out of this. If we take this and say, wow, this is an absolute fantastic time in our lives to reinvent ourselves and to reinvent our companies. And let's end it with the statement that we'll say over and over and over again, more space, less separation. And last, kudos to my good friend, Kev Casey there. We were trying to figure out how we're going to name this particular session and probably one or two after that will probably talk about how we now collectively as a company take this and deal with our suppliers and, and our clients. And so Kevin came up with this great word, which I love. And he's taken the word human and he's taken the word unity. And we've got this called, I don't know if I can pronounce it, but human unity. And it's, uh, I think it's very important that we as human beings are becoming more unified and it's uh, just leave it on that word. And